It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, certainly, the introduction of Hage is, uh, is important, and it's historic for them to, to be here, and we certainly welcome them all. Um, now let's get down to business. <laughs> Premier, uh, my question is for the Premier. Premier, Moody's credit rating agency has changed Ontario's debt rating outlook from stable to negative. After 11 years of Liberal regime in Ontario, you've managed to double our debt, and paying the interest on that debt is now the third largest expenditure in the budget. When referencing the debt, even former Liberal MPP Donna Cansfield said this province is in deep trouble. Premier, your proposed budget has caused a credit downgrade to hang over Ontario. Tell us today, does the government's fiscal plan take into account a further credit rating downgrade, which would cost, increase the cost of servicing the debt, or will you assure us that Washington. your budget will not result in a credit downgrade? Thank you. Thank you very much. So what I can assure the uh, Leader of the Opposition is that we are determined to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. Uh, we have laid that out in our budget, Mr. Speaker. We will reintroduce our budget next week, and we have been very, very clear about the constraints that we know have to be put in place, Mr. Speaker. We have been clear about that path to balance. But we've also been clear, and we were clear with the people of Ontario as we uh, went through the election campaign, our plan was based on investments in communities, investments in the talent and skills of our uh, people, our children, our grandchildren, Mr. Speaker, uh, investments in infrastructure that we know are necessary, whether it's roads or bridges, uh, whether it's transit, whether it's hospitals or schools, Mr. Speaker. Those investments are necessary Answer. in order for the province to, the, to thrive. That is the basis of our plan, Mr. Speaker, and it is laid out very Thank clearly you. in our budget documents. Again, to the Premier. Premier, you claim that you want to build Ontario up, but the fact is the massive debt your government has created is now threatening frontline services that we cherish here in Ontario, like health care and education. Even former Finance Minister Dwight Duncan says that the province's finances are a ticking time bomb. Yet you're still working to push through a budget that the credit rating agencies are already frowning upon. Premier, is it your intention to rush through this budget and shut down the legislature so that you can negotiate new public sector contracts without the legislature being in session to hold you to account? Mr. Speaker, uh, as the Leader of the Opposition knows, we, uh, we are back here within 20 days because I said that it was important that we get the budget reintroduced and that we have the opportunity to debate it. And We're willing to stay as long as that takes, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to have the budget debated and to make sure that, uh, that we, uh, we get the full input from, uh, from this House, Mr. Speaker. But you know, the, the reality that the Leader of the Opposition puts forward, that there are challenges ahead, that's not news to us. We know. We know Know that there are challenges, Mr. Speaker, and that's why that's why in our budget we lay out the path to balance. We understand the constraints that have to be in place. But, Mr. Speaker, the other reality is that there are investments needed, and I would just uh, I would just uh, call attention to a statement that uh, the member for Wellington uh, Halton Hills, ma Hills made yesterday in his uh, first member statement, and he talked yes, about the need in his riding. And I will quote uh, I will quote in the final supplementary, but he. He talked about the need in his riding for investments in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Well, the the, uh, the honourable member for Halton has. A I just say to the premier, the honourable member for Wellington Halton Hills has a far better record of uh, sticking up for his constituents and setting priorities because he was part of a government that set priorities for eight years in this province and balanced the budget. So, Premier, in Europe, in Europe, in Europe, they, they turn out any, any... That'll do. We've seen in Europe where they didn't care about the credit rating or didn't care enough about it, and they didn't care enough about their debt obligations. In fact, their debt obligations just kept growing that they actually did have to cut uh, services that we cherish here in Ontario, like health care and education. You need to treat the credit rating as sacrosanct to make sure that we spend within our means because we owe that to the hardworking people of Ontario. That's an obligation we have. Question. And we have a, a, an obligation to preserve frontline services. Premier, 
Will you take your time with the budget? We'll forgive you if you don't introduce it next Monday. Take your time with the budget, fix it, so that we don't lose Thank you. our current credit rating. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So what is sacrosanct to me, Mr. Speaker, is the needs of this province uh, and the needs of the people in this province, Mr. Speaker. And those needs are multifaceted. And as the leader of the opposition uh, notes, there are challenges ahead for our uh, fiscal situation, and we have laid out our path to balance in our budget. But, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, also a, a need to make investments in infrastructure. And the leader of the opposition references the uh, history of the uh, member for well. Wellington Halton Hills and his participation in the government, his membership in a government, and his membership in a government, Mr. Speaker, that in fact didn't make the investments that were needed, didn't make the investments in infrastructure that were needed, which is why yesterday he was standing in this House saying, on June 13th, the day after, and I'm quoting the member for Wellington Halton Hills, um, I wrote to the Premier on June 13th, the day after the election, we were back at work in my constituency office, I wrote to the Premier to highlight three key issues in my riding, the Highway 6 Morriston Bypass, Improved Go Train Service, and High-Speed Internet in rural Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, all Thank you. New question, the member from Nicholson. Thank you, uh, and good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier, and congratulations on uh, your uh, success. Uh, Premier, the day after you brought in your budget, uh, Moody's rang the first of many alarm bells. They said your deficit represented, quote, a credit negative for the province. They said, quote, the path to balance presents more risk than previously assessed. Premier, this is a clear signal, yet you're bringing back the same budget next week. Now, we know that your $12.5 billion deficit has already caused cuts in senior physiotherapy, cuts in cataract surgeries, cuts in diabetes testing strips. Premier, I'll ask you what cuts are coming next. Thank you, Premier. So again, Mr. Speaker, the uh the member for Nip Nipissing um, is, uh, is kind of playing both sides of the fence here because on the one hand he uh, reiterates what his leader uh, has said about uh, concerns about the fiscal situation, which I've acknowledged, Mr. Speaker, that there are challenges. There's, a, there's absolutely no doubt about that, but we have laid out a path to balance and we will reintroduce our budget uh, next week. But at the same time, he talks about the need for more spending, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we have to find ways to meet the needs of the people of this province. The issues that he raised in terms of health care are part of a transformation of the health care system that is absolutely critical, Mr. Speaker. We must provide services in a different way. We must provide more home care, more services in community, but we must Answer. provide those services. We cannot neglect those services, and we must make those investments in infrastructure that we, are, we know are needed in the uh, riding of Wellington, Halton Hills, and across Thank the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Well, I'll certainly let the 34 people at the hospital in North Bay know that they're part of a uh, transformation, and the 60 beds that were closed, I'll let them know that's part of a transformation. Premier, even more warning signals from financial experts came the very day after the election. The Financial Post revealed that Ontario's borrowing costs spiked the most in six months. BlackRock, the world's biggest money manager, said we were on quote, high alert for a credit rating downgrade for Ontario and noted that investors were, quote, seeing a deteriorating financial balance sheet. Premier, you're well aware that this will lead to extra borrowing costs, which will take away money from frontline services. Someone is going to feel the pain of your decisions. So who is it that will suffer next, Premier? Is it families? Is it seniors or Ontario's most vulnerable? Yes. Thank you, Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, there is, there is a fundamental disagreement be between the opposition and us. That fundamental disagreement is that we don't believe that starting with cutting 100,000 jobs and slashing services is the way to prosperity for the province. We just don't believe that. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, I think 
think that the people in, who work in the new hospital in North Bay and the people who work in the kids' treatment centre, the children's treatment centre in North Bay, I think they understand that investment in services is very important. They understand that investment in infrastructure is very important. So we will reintroduce our budget next week, Mr. Speaker. We have laid out a path to balance in that budget, Mr. Speaker. We have laid out the investment strategy that we believe is necessary at this point. We must do both of those, Mr. Speaker, if the province is to prosper. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Premier, the rating agency sent a further shot across your bow in an attempt to jolt you back to reality. Moody's now downgraded their credit outlook from stable to negative based on your plan to forge ahead with this budget. A formal credit rating downgrade is now forecast, which will not only drive up the cost of borrowing for the province, but also for linked agencies such as my city of North Bay, the city of Ottawa, University of Ottawa, University of Toronto, uh, the school board financing authority, all will downgrade along with the province. Rating agencies simply are not buying into this promise to balance in three years. Norm Levine of Portfolio Management stated, quote, you have not articulated in any way, shape or form how you would Question. get there. Premier, can you tell us today specifically what further cuts to frontline services will make your ba bu budget balance? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I just uh, I will just go back to what I said uh, previously, which is that there is a fundamental disagreement. We believe, Mr. Speaker, that if we do not make the investments in transit, in roads, in bridges, in schools, in hospitals, in the uh, education of our young people, Mr. Speaker, if we do not make those investments, if we do not provide opportunities for young people to have experience and to partner with business and get that work experience, if we do not transform the health care system and make sure that we have more home care in communities, if we don't do those things, Mr. Speaker, we believe, and in fact there's good evidence, that we will not have the future that will attract business to the province. We will not create those jobs in the short term and in the longer term. So there is a fundamental disagreement between Answer. us and the opposition. We will reintroduce our budget next week, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to the debate in the legislature on that plan that will build Ontario up. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, the Liberals have put forward a Trojan horse plan. The government is telling Ontarians that it is progressive, but scratch the surface, Speaker, and you'll find some real surprises there, like the fire sale of public assets. Now, you don't burn the furniture to heat the house, Speaker, so will the Premier tell Ontarians what public assets that she's planning to sell off? Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, um, as I uh, as I said yesterday, the leader of the third party actually ran. Her platform was actually based on the plan that we had put forward, Mr. Speaker. It was the foundation of the fiscal plan that she ran on. So, uh, you know, I, I just I think I just need to remind her that the uh, the plan that we are going to reintroduce next week, Mr. Speaker, is exactly the one on which she based her fiscal plan. So what we have said is that, yes, we are going to make sure that the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario work for the people of Ontario. We have asked Ed Clark, who is the former CEO of the Toronto Dominion Bank, that to look at to look at those assets, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they are working in the best way possible Answer. for the people of Ontario so that we can lay out that path to balance and so that we can make the investments that are necessary for the province. Well, Speaker, as the Premier knows, our public assets provide benefits to Ontarians. For example, one of OPG's jobs is to provide electricity without adding in the profit margin. Selling off OPG will turn into another it will turn it into another private power company looking to make more money from families and businesses. We know firsthand that privatized power has tripled hydro bills in this province since 2002. Will the Premier tell Ontarians whether she thinks it's the right thing to sell off OPG so it will turn into yet another private power company driving up their bills for private interests? Premier. So, um, you know, the, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition is making a huge leap, and I, I don't know exactly where she's uh, getting her uh, getting her information. But what we've said is that there are 
There are assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. I believe that it is responsible for government to make sure that those assets work for the people of Ontario. And I used, I used the example of the 407 yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and I'm going to use that example again because I believe that had we had how had the government of the day had a process in place to actually look at the 407 and to look at how it could be made, it could have been made Member to work for the people of Ontario. I don't think it would have been sold off, Mr. Speaker, at the rate that it was sold off, and I don't think that the people of Ontario would have then been robbed of that ongoing stream of revenue. So, I believe that it is responsible that the government make sure that assets work for the people of the province. That's what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, in 2013-14, the uh, LCBO put $1.7 billion into health care, education and other very important public services. That's long-term, stable source of public funds that comes from that agency. Even Mike Harris said that selling the LCBO didn't provide enough bang for our buck. And Ernie Eves said that selling off an asset that generates so much public revenue simply doesn't make any sense. Does the Premier think it makes sense to sell off the LCBO, Speaker? Premier? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I agree with the leader uh, of the third party. The LCBO is a terrific asset and provides a, a great benefit to the people of Ontario. And the uh, leader of the uh, third party is uh, making a leap of logic that you know just uh, is not uh, is not based in any reality. So what I've said is that we want to make sure that the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario work to the very optimal value possible for the people of Ontario. And, you know, I would, uh, I would ask the Leader of the Opposition, now that she's had some time to contemplate whether she will support the budget that we are bringing in, we're reintroducing on Monday, because it makes investments in transit, in roads, in bridges, in developmental services, Mr. Speaker, in support for personal support workers and home care. I would ask her whether she is prepared now to support that progressive budget that previously she did was not acceptable. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third Thank party. You, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Uh, the Premier told Ontarians that her plan was a rejection of austerity, but yesterday she wouldn't rule out cutting 100,000 public service jobs, and she didn't rule out the fire sale of public assets. So my question is a simple one, Speaker. Will the Premier come clear, clean with Ontarians and tell them whether or not she will rule out the firing of 100,000 people and the fire sale of public assets? Thank you, Premier. I, I just... It's almost breathtaking, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> um, because what our what our budget and our plan does is it lays out supports for personal support workers to make sure that personal support workers who are fundamental to transforming the health care system that they are paid adequately. It lays out raises for child care workers, Mr. Speaker, and the leader of the third party purports to be supportive of child care and the child care system. It lays out $810 million in investment in developmental services. Mr. Speaker, Mr. that's something that for years we have known is necessary, that there's a gap in our system. People, people have not had support. People with developmental Answer. disabilities, once they age out of school, haven't had the support that they need. We have suggested and we have put forward in our budget that we would make investments in those people. Thank you. I turn to the leader of the third party and say, why won't you Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier insists she's been up front with the people of Ontario, but she didn't dispute the comments made by the Liberals' hand-picked economist Don Drummond, who had this to say about the Liberal plan, and I quote, By 2017, Mr. I would be at all surprised order. if that involved the public sector about 100000 lower. Now, will the Premier be up front with Ontarians and tell them whether Don Drummond is right about the Liberal plan? 
Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I think that I think that the leader of the third party knows full well that uh, Don Drummond did not suggest that we were we were going in with a plan to cut 100,000 workers. He knows that. That's not that's not our plan. And I again, I would ask the leader of the uh, the third party, and I would ask the members who were saying that our plan will not happen. I would ask them for their support. Member from Essex, come to order. For their support, on top of the things that I uh, spoke about earlier, but our, their support for investments in public transit, investments in legal aid support, Mr. Speaker, which is part of our plan, an increased social assistance rate. I would ask for their support for those things. And to the to the uh, accusation that this will not happen, Mr. Speaker, I am more than determined. Answer. We are here sitting in the middle in the beginning of July because I am determined to bring back our budget. I am determined to work in this legislature to get it passed so that we can Thank make you. those investments in a better Ontario. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, New Democrats believe that government uh, should be investing in the concerns facing families, not adding to their concerns. Speaker, the, pre uh, the Premier's plan could see 100,000 people fired and our public assets sold off. Does the Premier think austerity is okay as long as it's splashed with a coat of red paint? <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, I guess, again, I would just ask, when the leader of the third party talks about the people about whom she's concerned, does that mean she's not concerned about personal support workers, she's not concerned about child care workers, she's not concerned about the people who will work to build the transit that we are going to invest in, Mr. Speaker, that she's not concerned about the families who can't get legal aid because they don't have enough support and our plan would give them more support? Is she not concerned about those people, Mr. Speaker, because my understanding of the NDP is they used to be so concerned about those people, Mr. Speaker, and we are concerned about those people. You see it, please? You see it? New question? The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. So, uh, thanks. Uh, my question is to the Minister of uh, Transportation. Just weeks before the election, the former Minister of Transportation announced your government would invest in high-speed rail from London to Toronto with a stop in Kitchener. Of course, he didn't— Stop the clock. I'm going to ask the member from Eglinton-Lawrence, the member from Eglinton-Lawrence and the member from Hamilton Stony uh, Creek, East Hamilton, East Stony Creek, take it outside. And in case anyone's missed the message, it's not about you two. Please finish your question. Thanks. The former minister didn't have a realistic cost estimate. He didn't have ridership numbers, and his announcement was routinely rejected by experts across the province. Still, he stuck to his guns, claiming you'd be delivering. Minister, we all know that liberal promises during elections aren't worth the paper that they're written on, so I'd like to give you a chance to set the record straight. Minister. Was this high speed minister, rail portfolio come to order? An actual commitment, or was the former minister just selling one of your election plans? He's an ideas guy. <laughs> minister of Transportation. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to begin by uh, by thanking uh, and actually welcoming the member from Kitchener Conestoga back to the legislature and thanking him for this question today. I also understand that he is the uh, PC. Uh, Caucus is transportation critics, so I look forward to having the chance to work closely with him and all other members on, uh, on all sides of the House to make sure that we deliver on the plan that the people of Ontario have elected us to do, Speaker. And that means that for communities like Kitchener and communities right across the province of Ontario, that it's crucial that we begin to get on with the work at hand, that we begin to make sure that the $29 billion that we've earmarked for transit and transportation infrastructure get rolled out so that communities like Kitchener and communities across this province have the benefits from those investments. Speaker, Speaker thanks very much. So uh, back to the minister. Toronto Star transit expert Greg Gormick says you're, quote, 
Back of the napkin high-speed rail plan is so out of sync with reality that its failings don't warrant cataloging, and it's not hard to see why. When the former minister made your high-speed rail commitment, he couldn't offer any details. He just said that he had a study somewhere which backed up his claims. Although he refused to release the study during the election, he told the media, quote, one of the first things we want to do if we're re-elected is to get those studies out Bullet there. Man. Minister, in the spirit of transparency, will you release this mystery study or will you continue to hide it because you know it won't back up your claims? Come on. Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for that supplementary question. It's important for everyone to understand that we are working very hard to finalize a business case for this particular project. But one of the things that I do want to highlight in my response today is how proud I was to serve alongside the former member from Kitchener Centre because of his extraordinary advocacy for his community and how much I'm looking forward to working closely with the new member from Kitchener-Conestoga, who is right here, uh, sorry, from Kitchener Centre Speaker, who I know will continue to be a champion for her community. As I said in my initial answer, Speaker, we are committed on this side of the House to making sure that we implement the $29 billion worth of crucial public infrastructure, public transit and transportation uh, uh, investments that are needed right across this province. I know the people of Kitchener and people in communities right across Ontario are delighted to know that we want to roll up our sleeves and get back to work to make sure that we Can deliver you? positive results for all of Ontario. Yeah. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Je voudrais... Minister, public health care advocates are at Queen's Park today to oppose this government plan to push even more services out of our hospital and into private for-profit clinics. In 2012, the Auditor General found over 800 private health care facilities in Ontario, and 97 per cent of them are for-profit. Now this government Trojan horse budget includes a third straight year of hospital budget freeze, which means cuts to hospital, increased user fees, and even more private for-profit clinics. Can the minister tell Ontarian why his government is so intent Question. on cutting hospital services and expanding private for-profit clinic in this province? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. That I'm happy to talk about the government's plan to improve quality of care, and I would think that the member opposite would also agree that it's important to provide care to people where they need it, when they need it, uh, as as, uh, as as easy as possible. And I want to emphasize. I want to say I'm glad as well. I'm uh, uh, we'll be speaking with the Ontario Health Coalition in about an hour's time. Uh, they have uh, an important day here. They're going to be advocating on a number of important issues. But I want to emphasize that we're only going to move these procedures into to not-for-profit clinics, and not all medically necessary procedures performed in these clinics will be covered by OHIP. And a good example is the Kensington Eye Clinic, which I suspect the member opposite supports, that here in Toronto has provided cataract surgery, low-risk procedures, to nearly 12,000 patients Answer. in Toronto, the GTA, in fact, around the province, helping to reduce wait times for cataract surgeries by 60 percent in the Toronto Central Lynn. So it's Thank this you. kind of movement which is going to provide better quality of care. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this government is moving services from an area that is not for profit, has oversight and accountability into the community that has no oversight, no accountability, and no way for people to know that they get quality care. Another year of austerity for a hospital leaves them with little choice but to carve out services and hand them out to those private providers. You're not going to be able to get a colonoscopy, an MRI, or an echogram into our publicly funded, not-for-profit, trusted community hospital under this government plan. You will have to go to a private for-profit clinic with all sorts of fees associated to them. The government talk about being progressive, but what I see on the ground is not. When will the minister recognize that his government health care agenda closes the door wide open to more privatizations where the real winners are the private clinics, not the patients? Thank you. Minister, 
Well, Mr. Speaker, that is simply not true. And the, the, the member opposite needs to understand what the facts are. I'm not sure if she's even read our platform and our action plan and what we propose to do. Here's what we're not doing, Mr. Speaker. We're not creating private for-profit clinics. We're not charging patients for OHIP services. We're not cutting care in our hospitals. We're not moving care further from home. This is what we're doing. We are shifting some routine, low-risk procedures out of the hospital and into the community through not-for-profit clinics, just like our hospitals are not-for-profit. I think the member opposite supports our hospitals being not-for-profits. We're talking about not-for-profit institutions in our communities. We're talking about two new midwife-led birthing centres in Toronto and Ottawa that are giving expectant mums more choice in where they deliver their babies. I would hope the member opposite would would support that type of community care, which is bringing great quality of care through not-for-profits in the community where patients Answer. want it at a better, a better cost to government and better result for the patients yeah. themselves. Thank you. The member from Trinity Spadina, question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Health and Long-Term Care. It's my privilege to represent the great riding of Trinity Spadina, one of the most culturally diverse ridings in Ontario. Every day, I'm reminded that our country is so great because of the contributions of newcomers. We're a welcoming country that is at the core of what makes us Canadian. So too is our commitment to universal health care the radical notion that no one should be denied care when they need it. That is why many in Tuni Spadina and across the country were deeply disappointed by the federal government's decision to reduce health coverage through the interim Question. federal health program. I understand there was a recent federal court ruling on those changes. Could the minister tell the House about this decision and how it relates to Ontario, Thank you. Ontario government policy? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to first uh, thank the member from Trinity Spadina for this excellent question and congratulate him on his election to the legislature. Uh, changes, Mr. Speaker, to the interim federal health program, a program and a population that I know very, very well, left many refugee claimants with little or no health coverage. This was a serious abdication of the federal government's responsibility to protect some of the most vulnerable people in our society, and it showed a lack of compassion, Mr. Speaker. A federal court ruling late last week ruled against that decision, calling it unconstitutional, Another even court. calling it cruel. We've all heard of heart-wrenching examples, a patient who suffered a retinal detachment, an incident that often leads to blindness, whose surgery was cancelled when he couldn't afford it. We learned of a diabetic patient only kept alive by free insulin Answer. samples that were provided by a pharmaceutical company. That doesn't reflect the values I know we share as Canadians. Making sure patients get care when they need it is the right thing to do, and it's my most fundamental responsibility as Minister, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Speaker. I am pleased that the court has recognized and upheld principles that underpin our commitment to universal health care. The court decision is a step in the right direction, but I understand that the federal government may appeal. In the meantime, it is clear that the minister's remarks that there, there are many people who need care right now but are no longer receiving it through the interim federal health program. Speaker, through you, could the minister tell us what is being done to ensure refugee claimants are getting the care they need? Thank you, Minister. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is right. Some refugee claimants face health challenges while waiting for the federal government to determine their status. And cuts to the IFHP, the federal health program, has left them unprotected and put our doctors and our health care workers in an untenable position, forcing them to choose who should and who shouldn't be treated. So that's why our government, the provincial government, opposed vigorously this decision, and it's why we joined with other provinces to reinstate access to essential and urgent health care services for refugee claimants through the Ontario Temporary Health Program. The federal court's ruling confirms what we've said all along, Mr. Speaker, that our 
health care system must reflect Answer. the principles of fairness and certainly compassion, Mr. Speaker, providing the right care for those who need it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. New question. The member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Premier, on June 4th, you received a 20-page document and letter from the municipality of Gray Highlands seeking your recommitment to move forward to the Grey Bruce Health Services Markdale Hospital. You received yet another letter from me on June 24th, where I reiterated my support for the hospital project. Premier, over the years, your government has had lots of conversations about this project. Regrettably, it's going on 11 years since your government pledged to build this hospital and nine years since the great people of Mark Dillon area raised $13.2 million, wow. which still sits in the bank. Fantastic. Premier, will you please tell me? Can you confirm that infrastructure money will be allocated in the budget and that the hospital promise your government made to my constituents was not purely made for partisan political purposes? Yep. Question. Thank you. Senator. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, I thank uh, the member opposite for the question. And of course, we're working closely with Markdale Hospital to uh, make progress on this important capital investment. Yeah. I appreciate the member bringing it to our attention again, and it reflects the uh, significant infrastructure investment, the capital investment that yeah. we're making in hospitals and health facilities yeah. right across this province. It's a, a multi million dollar uh, investment. In fact, uh, even when you look at uh, one aspect of this are small and rural hospitals. We've invested over $115 million towards capital investments to strengthen and care. Uh, with 90, in this year alone, this fiscal year, 91 different projects across the province where we're working uh, with partners, important partners Answer. like uh, Markdale, to make sure that we're making that progress through capital and operating uh, uh, investments to ensure that the quality of care uh, continues to uh, improve for patients that so badly need it. Again, supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. Premier, to be fair, six years ago you did actually erect the sign promising and committing to this project to the Markdale Hospital. You know this hospital project is of profound concern and need to my constituents. The community stepped up to the challenge and raised $13.2 million as part of their challenge you put in front of them, and they want you to honour your commitment. Premier, I respectfully ask you, do you accept that the case for a rebuild is strong, and on what timeline do you envisage this redevelopment taking place? Yep. Thank you, Minister. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm pleased that the member opposite, like I'm sure many members in the Conservative caucus, uh, acknowledge and agree that infrastructure investment exactly. is yeah. of vital importance to this province yeah. going forward. Yeah. And so, so the $129 million billion dollar investment over the next 10 years that this province that this province is making and how much is it for hospitals? Pardon me? $11.4 billion specifically for hospital capital investments. I'm glad that you acknowledge the importance of that. We are working closely with Markdale. There's no doubt that there will be further conversations to see how we can move that project forward in as expeditious a manner as possible. I'd be happy to sit down with the member opposite to talk to him. I know this is an important project to him, and I look forward to seeing how we can continue this project together. Question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Premier how much this government plans to pocket from the whole or partial privatization of the LCBO, Hydro One, and Ontario Power Generation. Wow. I ask because on page four of the Liberal Party's infrastructure program, it clearly states the plan is to pocket $3.15 billion from the sale of public assets. The Premier and the Minister of Finance refused to answer my question yesterday, so I'm giving it another shot. Another opportunity, Premier. Will the government tell this House how much is slotted into the government's fiscal framework for the full or, private or partial sale of these core public assets? Well, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the, the member opposite knows, if he looks at the budget, uh, the, uh, the numbers that we have laid out in terms of our, uh, our projections, in terms of our revenue, in terms of uh, the investments that are necessary. But 
you know, he's asking, he's asking a question that I've actually already answered. What I've said is that we have asked Ed Clark and his team to look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario to make sure that they are working to the very best benefit of the people of Ontario. I believe that it's government's responsibility to do that, to make sure that we optimize the value of those, uh, of those uh, entities, whether it's real estate, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's an organization. So that's what Ed Clark is uh, going to do with his, uh, with his group, Mr. Speaker, and we will absolutely keep the House and the people of Ontario apprised of the optimization of those, uh, of those assets. But I don't have the specific answers at this point, Mr. Speaker, because we've asked him to do that work. The $3.15 billion asset sale figure from your platform is interesting because 15 years ago, the Mike Harris PCs sold off Highway 407 for $3.1 billion. We're talking that scale of sale. If you know you're going to raise at least $3.15 billion from overall asset sales, you also know how much you're planning to get from the whole or partial sale of OPG, LCBO, and Hydro One. So this time, please answer the question, how much of the $3.15 billion that your platform says will be raised through asset sales comes from the sale of LCBO, OPG, and Hydro One assets? Mr. Speaker, the member for Toronto Danforth is jumping to a conclusion that is not a foregone conclusion, Mr. Speaker. He's leaping to uh, he's leaping to an endpoint that may or may not be the case, Mr. Speaker. He's engaging in a hypothetical that I am not going to uh, I'm not going to go down that road, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is, we've asked Ed Clark to make to look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. I'm glad that the member raised the issue of the 407 because it reinforces my point, which is, had there been a process when the previous government was in office, had there been a rational process to look at that asset, the 407, I believe that different decisions would have been made and the people of Ontario would have benefited much more and would, have not, would not have lost that asset and the ongoing stream of revenue that is lost to the people of Ontario because of a decision made by a government that did not take the time and did not take the responsibility to do it right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Now, when our parents and grandparents and maybe sometimes some members of this House uh, can no longer be cared for in their homes and they need to transition to long-term care, and in my community of Beaches, this York, there are many who are transitioning into long-term care homes, we want to make sure that they are kept and tra they transition to homes that they uh, that we want the best possible care for them when they transition. And I know that investing in long-term care has been a priority for our government. It's an important part of that, and is redeveloping older facilities so that they can provide state-of-the-art care in renewed space. Could the minister inform this house of the government's plan for long-term care reinvestments? Thank you, the Associate Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to begin by thanking the member from Beaches East York for the question and congratulations on an excellent win. <laughs> Speaker, I'm committed to the 77,000 residents who live in Ontario's long-term long -term care home facilities that they will get the highest standards of care. And a big part of this commitment, Speaker, is our plan to modernize our existing facilities. And that is why our budget had money set aside so that we could help our long-term care operators to redevelop and modernize 30,000 beds. Unfortunately, the PCs and the NDP voted against this budget. I look forward to the reintroduction and passage of this budget, Speaker, so that we can get on with the work of redeveloping and modernizing these 30,000 beds and investing in us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister, and to you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure that the residents of the long care facilities in the beaches of East York, such as uh, True Davidson's Acres and uh, Ena Crafton, and their loved ones were very pleased to hear that this government is, has plans to redevelop and create so many more beds in the communities and in the, across the province. But as we all know, in the long care facilities, it's not just the residents who depend, it is not just residents 
uh, they receive from hardworking nurses, they need personal support workers and other frontline health care workers in this long-term sector. Speaker, through you, would the minister please tell us what the government is doing to ensure that residents in long-term homes receive the best possible care that they can get? Thank you, Minister. Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member from Beaches East York. I also want to thank the thousands of Ontarians who go to work in long-term care homes every single day yeah, yeah. to care for our family and friends. Our government has, that is why, funded over 10,000 new wow. full-time frontline staff in long-term care since 2003, and we have provided homes with $20 million so that they can provide training to their staff to improve safety of our residents and advance the quality of care. We've also hired over 600 full-time staff since 2011 through our Behavioral Supports Ontario to improve care for residents with challenging behaviours. And we're adding 75 nurse practitioners in our LTC homes to prevent unnecessary ambulance use, prevent injuries and improve resident care. And we've brought in tough legislation to protect residents Answer. by allowing stronger enforcement and better inspections of long-term care homes. We will continue to make investments in our long-term care sector. Thank you. Question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Attorney General. Speaker, in February, my private member's resolution called on uh, this government to implement a comprehensive long-term solution to reform joint and several liability uh, uh, insurance for municipalities, and to do this by June. AMO, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, insurers, insurers in Perth, Wellington and beyond, and over 200 municipalities have supported it. All parties in this legislature, le legislature supported it, yet the June deadline has passed. I will ask the minister this question. When will you get it done? Thank you, Attorney General. Yes, merci, uh, merci, Monsieur le Président, and I want to thank the member for asking and be uh, so persistent with the question. Uh, however, this uh, legal liability uh, reform is an important and uh, complex issue, and uh, I understand that uh, this uh, issue has been uh, of significant concern for municipality. The AMO, the Association of Municipality of Ontario, has asked the government to consider the impact of the law of joint and several liability on municipal insurance. And my ministry, the Ministry of the Attorney General and the legal community on uh, two options uh, are uh, under uh, consideration. Uh, one of the model is a uh, modification of joint and several liability, and it, it could look very simple for some of us, but it's a very complex issue. And indeed, you know, there, if this uh, uh, bill is passed, there will be a winner and loser, and that's why uh, that's what we have to consider before moving forward with Thank it. You. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, with in all due respect, this has been going on since I was a councillor back in the municipality of North Perth, and that goes back uh, seven or eight years that I have heard about this issue. AMO and many municipalities are supporting a combined model, which would place reasonable limits on the damages that could be recovered from a municipality. In Perth, Wellington, municipalities including Stratford and the County of Wellington are asking you to support this. Minister, the time for consultations is over. Municipalities have spoken. My question is this. When will you get her done? Thank you. Again, Mr. Chair, you know this is a, a complex issue. There is two different models that are, have been suggested. One of the model that the uh, the member is talking about it's a it's a model that was uh, adopted in Saskatchewan, uh, and uh, you know we we are uh, reviewing uh, this this model, and another model will uh, limit uh, municipal liability for negligence in road maintenance to two times the proportion of damage. But like I said, you know, in 
in one of the two or in the two uh, situation there will be a loser uh, winner and loser and it's a, it's a very complex matter and we wanted to make sure that we have it right be before we move forward thank you very much thank you any question the leader of the third party uh, thank you speaker my questions for the premier when ontario families need hospital care they should be able to trust that there's actually room at their local hospital but that's not the case in thunder bay for much of this year thunder bay regional health sciences center has has been literally in gridlock. They have funding for 395 beds, but they routinely have 30 more patients waiting for a bed. They're doing the best they can to provide care, Speaker, and that's pushed their deficit to $5.5 million. So my question is this, when will the government step up and provide the funding for hospital beds that Thunder Bay so obviously needs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm really happy to get this question, actually, because we have provided that funding and we are making important improvements to health care in Thunder Bay and the Thunder Bay region. In fact, I have to thank the members from Thunder Bay Superior North and the member from Thunder Bay Adequate, yeah. particularly for their hard work and their advocacy for this uh, and, and, and the community leaders that they've been working with vigorously uh, on this, this issue. Recently, we announced that we're investing almost $14 million to improve access access to emergency care yep. and to enhance community health care services, yep. measures which will improve uh, not only those types of services but, of course, the hospital-based care that's available to uh, residents of that region. And This additional funding is going to support Thunder Bay's three largest health care providers, Mr. Speaker, the Regional yep. Health Sciences Centre, St. Joseph's Care Group, and the Northwest Community Care Access Centre. Yep. These are important measures. I'm happy to speak uh, in more detail in the supplementary. Thank you. Well, Speaker, the Liberals have made uh, many, many promises, but the fact is that health care austerity continues under this year's Trojan horse budget. Another year of frozen hospital budgets means there's not enough hospital beds in Thunder Bay and their deficit is ballooning. Now, this government's decisions are putting pressure on everything from staffing to laundry services. In fact, the way the hospital is coping with the lack of funding is to open 300 new parking spots to raise money off patients to try to pay their bills. Now, when will the Premier announce a real plan to address the gridlock in the Thunder Bay Hospital? Minister. Well, again, again, Mr. Speaker, the facts just don't match with what the member opposite, the leader of the third party, is saying. We've, yeah. We're creating 26 new hospital beds to help more people with long-term illness yeah. or disabilities receive the specialized care that they need. We're funding up to 17 more spaces in supportive housing so that seniors and people in need of care can remain independent it's, it's, and out of hospital, Mr. Speaker. We're expanding a nurse outreach program to provide up to 500 more seniors and people with complex needs with home care services. Services, again, to keep them as close to home as possible and out of hospital, staffing 10 acute care hospital beds to treat up to 600 more patients per year, and helping to recruit up to 10 full-time and 14 temporary emergency room doctors to improve access to urgent care. Yep. These are the steps that we're taking. We're investing dollars to do that. They're important improvements to that region, that important region of the sir. province. So I'm not sure where the member opposite is trying to go to. We are seeing the progress that we want to see in terms of quality of care. Here, here. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, this summer many young people are starting new jobs in restaurants, golf courses and retail shops around the province. I know in my community of Newmarket Aurora, the numerous golf courses, auto part manufacturers like Van Robb and Upper Canada uh, and Magna will offer many new job opportunities for youth. But the statistics show, Minister, that young people are three times more likely to be injured in the first three months of their job than experienced colleagues. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what are we doing to ensure that our newest and least experienced workers are safe at work? Thank you, Speaker, and let me first congratulate the fine new member from Newmarket Aurora, and congratulations on being elected to the House. And speaker, speaker, the question, uh, the question is a very important one. We're all saddened in this house when we hear of a workplace fatality, when it involves a young person and the family and the co-workers of those who have been injured or killed. I know her hearts go out. 
And the more tragic, or the equally tragic part of that, is that these, these incidents that lead to injury or death are indeed often preventable. As the member said, it's true that new and young workers are most likely to get hurt. So that's why the ministry conducts an annual safety blitz for new and young workers. And the goals of this blitz are very, very simple, Speaker. We ensure that new and young workers are properly oriented, trained and supervised. We ensure that their employers are taking every reasonable precaution to protect new and young workers. But, Speaker, we need everyone playing a role in this and in keeping our workplaces safe. This blitz is going to raise awareness of workplace health and safety amongst our young people. Thank you. Supplementary. And thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Uh, we know that our youth are helping to build a stronger and more competitive economy here in Ontario, and I was encouraged to hear about the Minister's annual health and safety blitz. I think it's very important to be out there in the summer educating and enforcing safety rules as students work to save for college and university. But surely the Minister's safety blitz cannot go to every single workplace in the province. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what is the government doing to ensure that all new young workers have access and an understanding of their basic health and safety rights? Also, what is the Ministry doing to ensure that those youth whose first language is not English are properly trained in health and safety. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member for another fine question. I want to assure the legislature that this ministry takes health and safety very, very seriously, reducing injuries, eliminating fatalities, number one uh, priority for this ministry. Last fall, Speaker, we passed uh, a regulation that made it mandatory for all workers and supervisors to complete basic health and safety training. Now, as of July 1st of this year, just recently, workers and supervisors are required to have taken this training. And, Speaker, I should note that that includes everybody in this room, including yourself. We have made it easy to complete this training online at the Ministry of Labour website or through free workbooks available at Service Ontario locations. Across the province, it comes in many languages, English, French, Chinese, Spanish, Punjabi, Portuguese, Hindi, just to name a few. It's true that many Ontarians will already be aware of these basic rights and responsibilities, but the exercise we're going through with the mandatory training that came into effect is going to make a good Answer. system even better, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Holloman Norfolk. Speaker, uh, to the Premier. Premier, just before you became Liberal leader in 2012, you made a commitment to eliminate Ontario's deficit by fiscal year 2017-18, a promise you continue to reiterate. I'll go back to your quote of 2012. When I say we need to stay on government's fiscal plan, balancing the budget by 2017-18, I mean it. So, you say in three years, a zero deficit. However, your hand-picked economist, Don Drummond, projects in three years, he projects in three years a $30.2 billion deficit. Premier, how do you square this $30.2 billion discrepancy? Well, thank you, Speaker. And, uh, I, I think I would advise the member opposite to actually read what Don Drummond had to say about that. The point he was making was, if we did nothing, that is the reality we would be facing, Speaker. What we have done is uh, made very clear steps to uh, to reduce our, our deficit. That's uh, that's enough. Finish, please. Uh, we are committed to balancing the budget by 17-18, Speaker, and we've had to make some tough decisions in the past in order to move to that direction. And every single time we took a difficult decision, you stood up in opposition to that. So what I'm saying is that all of us agree, all three parties agree, we must get to balance. So we're looking for constructive ways to get there. You do have some responsibility to support the transformation that we Thank you. The, uh, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, will come to order. Supplementary. 
Well, uh, back to the Premier, Speaker. We have no indication from you of how your promise will be kept. Nothing will come of nothing. Your Minister of Finance is expecting revenue shortfalls in the coming years. Back to the Premier. Minister how without portfolio promise? To order last time. Is it selling assets, cutting government programs and services for families, seniors, vulnerable in our society, jacking up taxes on the middle class? Or do you plan on breaking your promise to balance the books in three years? What is the plan for 1718? Is it to cut government spending by $30.2 billion? Is that the plan? Thank you. Uh, Speaker, I think all of us are looking forward to the budget being introduced next week. I don't think there will be any surprises, though, because we've committed to introducing the same budget that was not supported by either party when we do introduced it earlier this year. It clearly lays out a path. And, and, Speaker, we have actually become the lowest uh, uh, spender in the country on a per capita basis. Our program spending is down to 1.4 per cent annually. We're looking ahead to 1.1 per cent annually, Speaker. We're on track to beating those deficit targets. But what I don't understand is that we seem to have a austerity everywhere but my riding attitude in, uh, on your side of the house, where people will stand up and advocate for more spending in their riding, but no spending overall. Minister of Health, Speaker, recent reports say that parking fees at the Jurovinsky Cancer Centre in my riding of Hamilton Mountain would be raised to as much as $25 a day, which is a 25 per cent increase. One patient who travels to receive care puts it this way, quote, they know they have a captive audience, end quote. Parking fees amount to a health care levy on sick people. Speaker, when will this government follow through on its election promise to cap out-of-control parking hospital fees? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question because it gives, us, gives me the opportunity on behalf of the government to uh, remind the members opposite that, in fact, in our platform during the election, we committed to putting a cap on parking fees uh, at hospitals, at our health care facilities. And I agree with the member opposite that it's incredibly important that access to our health care services is uh, provided in an equitable fashion. So we intend on moving forward as we committed uh, in our platform, yeah. uh, and uh, I'm glad that uh, I suspect we're going to have the uh, third party support on that. Yeah. That's Thank good. You, supplementary. Speaker, just so the minister knows, the fees have already been increased last week. <laughs> so the Canadian Medical Association and New Democrats called hosp hospital parking fees a barrier to health care access and an unnecessary stress on patients and families. The Liberal government may not see it, but the people in my riding and people across this province need relief now from these out-of-control parking fees. We haven't seen any directive to the hospital administrators to cap the fees, even though you made the pledge during your election campaign. Since, the since then, the government's been silent. My constituents are hoping that this is not just something that was said at election time. Speaker, when will this minister act immediately and cap hospital parking fees? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and I'm glad to have the member opposite support. It's too bad that you didn't put it in your platform. <laughs> it was that important to you then. And, but we did, and it's a commitment that we're going to follow through on. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to be working closely with local communities, with our hospitals and our health care facilities, because one size does not fit all. The circumstance in a particular community or locality is different from one to the next. So we're going to work in a responsible fashion, and we're going to cap or, in some cases, cut hospital parking fees. So um, I want to... Uh leave the members with a message. It's never too late to receive a warning, nor never too late to be named. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.